Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast covering documentary film. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival, known as TIFF. I'm recording this in August, and the new edition of TIFF is coming very soon. Last year at the festival, audiences saw the world premieres of I Am Not Your Negro, Citizen Jane, and Abacus Small Enough to Jail, all those films we've covered on past episodes. Now, I'm here to give you a preview of what to expect from TIFF 2017. I'll be spreading this across two episodes. You're gonna hear about what's new from well-known directors like Morgan Spurlock, Frederick Wiseman, Heidi Ewing, and Rachel Grady. I'll also talk about prominent figures like Grace Jones, Jane Goodall, and Barack Obama featured in this year's TIFF documentaries. You'll hear clips from those films being made public for the first time. Several of these films will get distribution in the fall, and a few may wind up as Oscar contenders. I'll bring some of them to New York in my other job programming for the Doc NYC Festival in November. Today I'm joined by TIFF Docs Programming Associate Dorota Lech. For the past five years, she's been my colleague watching thousands of documentary submissions. She also oversees TIFF Doc Conference and scouts East European fiction films for other TIFF sections. For the rest of the year, she has a different job working for the Hot Docs International Documentary Festival. She produces the Hot Docs Pitch Forum, where filmmakers are selected to present their works in progress to funders and other decision makers. Uh, Dorota, what stands out to you in this year's lineup? Thank you for having me, first of all. We're very happy to have you. Well, submissions were up this year, which is a consistent trend. We also had two dedicated pre-screeners, Betty Shi and Natalia Hunter-Young, who helped us screen the thousands of submissions we received, so special shout out to them. Thank you, Betty and Natalia. We each watched over a couple hundred films and discussed the ones that made the strongest impressions on us, which was really a significant number this year. Truly, it was a difficult year for selections. I will second that. I'm also pleased, very pleased, that out of the 38 feature-length documentaries in the festival, and this is across categories, so it includes the master's section, special presentations, wavelengths, and of course, TIFF docs, 19 are directed by women, so that's exactly 50%. All right, we're going to get into exploring notable themes at this year's festival, including music, politics, and a big collection of films about black cultural icons. There are some films that we've been tracking a long time and others that came to us as a complete surprise. Let's start with a film chosen to be opening night of the TIFF Doc selection. This is life. This is a fate. This is a cop. This is a story I didn't make up. This is a girl lost in the wood. Some covered wagon from some other hood. The title of the film is Grace Jones, Bloodlight, and Bammy. Bloodlight refers to the red light you sometimes see outside a recording studio when it's in session. Bami is a Jamaican bread, and those two words refer to art and life. Grace Jones, of course, is the 1970s model turned singer, actress, and icon. Director Sophie Fines has been filming with Jones for 10 years in Jamaica, Paris, London, New York, and elsewhere. Here's a clip of Jones in a Paris hotel room having breakfast after a performance. The performer out there takes the risk. And I always say to everyone, if the lights should go out, if the roof, the electricity, the sound fails, I can still perform and hold the audience in the dark without any without any trimmings oh yeah she really does hold the audience in this time in doc form i'm really excited for our audiences to see this one I've known of Grace as a cultural icon for a long time. I actually think my first exposure was probably her as Mayday in A View to Kill. Um, James Bond films were forbidden where I grew up because of all the Russian villains. And I guess one of my uncles had a bootleg VHS, and I remember seeing her and just having my mind blown. You're talking about Poland, where you grew up. Yes, but the villains were always Russian. Yeah. (laughs) The filmmaking in this documentary is as unconventional as its subject Sophie Fines isn't gathering archive and sitting down doing interviews. She's bringing us into Grace Jones's world. Interspersed through the film are performance numbers from a show that Jones staged in Dublin last year specifically for Fines to film. 
when we announced this film over the summer, the trailer got more hits than any other at the festival. Now let's talk about other prominent directors in the TIFF doc section. We can start with Morgan Spurlock. He's here with a sequel, Super Size Me 2, Holy Chicken, it's called. Spurlock was on Pure Nonfiction episode 27 talking about the original Super Size Me. If you're wondering what he could add to that first film, the answer is plenty. This project began because he was noticing that fast food had undergone a kind of transformation using buzzwords like healthy, fresh, natural. So he set out to open his own fast food chicken restaurant, and we follow him through that process. In this clip, he talks to a food trend expert, Darren Tristano. Well, I think healthy food depends on the definition of health. What do you mean by that? So we started to see health change and evolve based on health halos. What is a health halo? What's that mean? Well, a health halo is when there are terms associated with certain products that, that make it feel healthier. Okay, give me some examples. So examples would be fresh and natural, um, handcrafted has become big, artisan, homemade, scratch, things where consumers feel good about the food and the ingredients. Even when I deep fry it? Even when you deep fry it. That's incredible. The term fried has evolved to crispy. Fried has a very negative halo around it. Right. Of course, there's an absurdity to the health halo, and Spurlock brings his comedy to decode what's really going on behind those words. You know, as someone who mostly eats a plant-based diet, I've found this film particularly hard to digest. Um, wah, wah. Yeah, that's a pun for all your vegan listeners. <laughs> Okay, on to a new film by the Oscar-nominated directors of Jesus Camp, Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady. The film is called One of Us, and it's set in New York's Hasidic Jewish community. It's about three members of the community who are looking to lead more secular lives and the incredible pressures they face when they try to step out of the community. One is a man in his 30s named Loser, that's L-U-Z-E-R, he left the community to pursue his dreams to be an actor in Los Angeles. You know, my excitement for the secular world is based on movies. My understanding of the secular world based on movies. My, my idea of fun in the secular world is based on movies. But when you, when, when you look at the outside world, your perception of it is wrong. And then you go out there and you realize that actually, if I leave, I might have to work at McDonald's. Because you don't have any skills, what are you going to do? They have designed a society where you're unable to make it in the outside world. They've designed a world where if you leave it, your only way, your own, the only way you can survive is by being a criminal. Everybody who leaves, they say everybody who leaves eventually comes back or they end up in jail or in rehab. There's another woman in the film named Eddie who is trying to escape an abusive marriage. The filmmakers follow these stories for over a year at times, this film feels like a thriller. My heart was racing throughout. Honestly, I think a lot of your listeners will know Heidi and Rachel from one of their previous films, Jesus Camp, which covered a different type of religious extremism. Actually, I was at a cottage uh, up north of here this summer, and the convenience store, which was the only place to buy anything in, in like a 20-kilometer radius, had it, uh, had it in their cute little rental shelf, and it was the only dock, so I, I guess it's still quite popular. Go Jesus Camp. <laughs> Another Oscar nominee at the festival is Brett Morgan. He's known for his films like The Kid Stays in the Picture and his last one, Cobain Montage of Heck. He has a highly anticipated film about the primatologist Jane Goodall, simply titled Jane. <sighs> Jane Goodall. I know you're looking forward to this one. <laughs> I really am. What's special about this film is that Morgan got hold of extensive archival footage of Goodall in her 20s, like 140 hours of 16 millimeter footage from when she was first studying chimpanzees in Gombe Stream National Park. The film has an original score by Philip Glass, and it plays like a romantic epic. Morgan does an extensive interview with Goodall. In this clip, she remembers being a young woman when she dreamed of being a man. I was typically a man. I went on adventures. What do you think that is? Probably because at the time I wanted to do things which men did and women didn't. You know, going to Africa, living with animals. That's all I ever thought about. 
A lot of celebrities come to TIFF, but the person I'm honestly most excited to see is Jane Goodall. A lot of people are familiar with her work, but hearing from her and seeing her as a person who followed and dedicated herself to her passion really made a huge impact on me. Also, I, I hear that when she speaks on stage, she's sometimes been known to impersonate some of the chimpanzees and, and you know, teach the audiences about their behavior and do some impressions. So I'm particularly excited for that. Well, we are expecting her here for the first screening. Uh, so I guess we have that to look forward to. We need to practice. <laughs> we need to learn how to say I love you. <laughs> On to our next film, The Final Year, directed by Greg Barker. This film has remarkable access into the final year of Barack Obama's administration, focusing on key members of his foreign policy team. One of them is UN Ambassador Samantha Power. Here is a clip recorded in January 2016 as she faces the year ahead. I feel like we should have, you know, a clock up with the days counting down because what we have set in motion, whether Cuba normalization, climate change, Syria, you know, incredibly important issues of our national security, you know, all of that is at stake. Another prominent character in this film is Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes, who is a key speechwriter for Obama. This is him speaking in early 2016. One of the things I want to do with the time remaining, you know, is to just try to convey that this is a different way of doing foreign policy. It's, it's less militarized and it's more engagement focused. And the areas where we're actually making progress and achieving big results in foreign policy are areas where we've been able to re-elevate diplomacy. Another scene that really stood out to me in this film is Samantha Power on a trip to Nigeria to meet the mothers whose daughters were taken by Boko Haram. It's very moving and it's also very difficult to watch. And it made me think a lot about how important the quality of empathy is in a politician. And then, of course, I thought about the current state of affairs and just maybe I should stop talking before I start raging and then crying. Yes. Well, uh, this film is going to bring out a strong emotional reaction in a lot of audiences. Uh, we're expecting Samantha Power and Ben Rhodes uh, to be uh, at the early screenings, and I'm told that there's a bunch of other people from the Obama administration uh, who are coming up to, to see this film, so that's going to be a special one. Before we wrap up talking about some of the most prominent directors, Dorota, I know you're looking forward to seeing one. Frederick Wiseman. Swoon! <laughs> this is Frederick's seventh time at the festival in the last nine years. He's 87, but not showing any signs of slowing down, thankfully. So his new film is called Ex Libris, the New York Public Library. This continues the work he's been doing for 50 years of looking at different institutions. Uh, the film is three and a half hours long and uh, covers all aspects of the library from the leadership to the lowest workers. One of the aspects I loved about this film is how it seamlessly weaves conversations and verbal information. A recurring figure in this film is the president of the New York Public Library, Anthony Marks. We see him in leadership meetings and get a real insight into the inner cogs. Here's a clip. On to homeless patrons. Everyone recognizes the problem seems to be increasing. Yeah. Um, everyone recognizes that the library has a responsibility to serve all patrons and to be welcoming. Mm -hmm. But there is sometimes a tension between what one kind of patron needs and what another kind of patron needs. And so lines have to be drawn about, you know, how do we accommodate right. people together who may not always want to be together and be respectful of everyone. And then there was the question of what is the appropriate role of the library, not just as welcoming space uh, for everyone, but, you know, where should we be intervening in social policy around the homeless right. as versus where should we be relying on the city, other private agencies that are expert exactly. and engaged in this as we all face this problem. So we have scenes like that of leadership meetings. There are scenes in different branches around New York City from Greenwich Village to Chinatown to the Bronx to Chelsea. Uh, and one of the pleasures of the film is that we get to hear from some of the special guest speakers who come in and out of the library. They include people like Elvis Costello, Patti Smith, 
Ta-Nehisi Coates, the philosopher Richard Dawkins. And we get snatches of their conversation that feed into this tapestry of New York City at this time that, that Wiseman is portraying. I agree. It made me want to go back. Dorota, what's a favorite scene of yours in this film? Uh, there's a scene that takes place in a library in Harlem, and the topic at hand is textbooks, and specifically how U.S. history books deal with slavery. And it's really fascinating to see the parents and various members of the community give testimonies as to why it's important to tell American history as it happened. Uh, because currently, as we learn in this film, there, there's a lot of misrepresentation in history books that are that are all over the country. I actually talked to Wiseman about that scene uh, and other parts of the film uh, in a conversation that will be coming up on a future episode of Pure Nonfiction. Um, this film, soon after it plays at TIFF, is going to be opening up in New York City at the Film Forum and, and then making its way across the country this fall. So that's one that you'll have a chance to see very soon, even if you're not at TIFF. So several of the films we've discussed so far are ones that I'd been hearing about for months and sometimes years. Uh, Frederick Wiseman's film was filmed in 2015, and, uh, and I remember him being in New York at that time. So there's things like that that I've been tracking for a long time. But uh, now I want to talk about four films that came as complete and very happy surprises to me. Let me start with the director Chris Smith. In 1999, he made a big impression with his documentary, American Movie. I hosted him here at TIFF in 2009 with his film, Collapse, about one man's perspective on the American economy. He's a very thoughtful filmmaker who's always worth paying attention to. Now, he's back this year with a film that has the longest title of any at the festival. We're going to have to break this up between us. Okay. Jim and Andy. The Great Beyond. The story of Jim Carrey and Andy Kaufman. With a very special and contractually obligated mention of... Tony Clifton. <laughs> that is the full, full title. Uh, most people will refer to this film as Jim and Andy. But we won't. We say the full title every time. <laughs> uh, which of us is introducing this film at the festival? I believe it's you. Okay. I have to write that one down. So people may remember that Jim Carrey portrayed the eccentric comedian Andy Kaufman in the 1999 Milos Forman film, The Man on the Moon. During the months of that filming, Jim Carrey was staying in character uh, the whole time, uh, both on the set and apparently off. And he had a video crew following him. That footage was never made public. Uh, I think the publicists were afraid, someone says in the film, that people would hate Jim Carrey if they saw that footage. I like him more. I, it's all in the eye of the beholder, I guess. <laughs> uh, so Chris Smith has that footage with the permission of Jim Carrey. And uh, he weaves it together with a new, very candid, very probing interview with Carrey. Now, for people who don't remember, Andy Kaufman was like a kind of performance artist comedian. He had many different personas that were often pushing the boundaries of decency. In one persona, he was challenging women in wrestling matches. In the film, we see archive footage of Kaufman at a wrestling match in full obnoxious mode. Now, I'm not saying women are mentally uh, inferior to men because uh, when it comes to things like uh, oh, cooking and cleaning, washing the potatoes, scrubbing the carrots. Then we see Carrie performing the same scene in Man on the Moon. The babies the floors. Making the babies, mopping the floors. They have it all over men. I believe that. But when it comes to wrestling... Shut up! And Kerry discusses this in an interview. Women's movement was exploding at that time, and he went the other way and said they should be in the kitchen and all this stuff. He just was on his own wavelength, and you were either going to join or you weren't, and he seemed to thrive off those who didn't. It was like when Jesus said, you know, eat my body and drink my blood. It's a way to, like, weed out the crowd. Honestly, I, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know much about Andy Kaufman and have not seen Man on the Moon. So for others who share that cultural blind spot, there's plenty else to enjoy in this film. I do know Jim Carrey. What are your favorite Jim Carrey movies? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Truman Show, Dumb and Dumber. Could watch Dumb and Dumber every day, probably. You're a Jim Carrey aficionado. <laughs> He came to the Doc NYC Festival a couple of years ago to support the film Rubble Kings, and he was quite a nice guy, I gotta say. 
All right. Uh, another surprise for me was the film The China Hustle. I know the executive producers, Alex Gibney and Frank Marshall, both of them have been on pure nonfiction before. But I wasn't familiar with the director, Jed Rothstein, who's largely worked on television documentaries. In The China Hustle, he delivers a big screen investigation of financial fraud that reminds me of films like Inside Job and Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. The difference is those films were looking back on well-known scandals. This one covers corruption that's still unfolding. After the 2008 financial crisis, investment bankers were looking for areas of growth and turned to Chinese companies. There was a boom period when many Chinese companies made reverse mergers with companies already listed on the stock exchange. Many of those companies were posting huge growth. In the film, we hear from investors who traveled to China to see this growth for themselves. Here they describe a visit to a paper factory. It was a complete dump. Half the machines were broken, weren't working. Garbage rotting out in the front yard, no signage. And this is their main manufacturing facility. There's water everywhere. All right, this is a company that's a paper company. The company had just claimed to have clocked in 100 million US in revenue, which was up substantially from the year before. How is this growing 50% a year? One of the key figures in the film is a whistleblower named Dan David. He had been investing in these companies until he realized something fishy was going on. He describes larger problems in the fabric of American banking. When you talk about the investment banks, especially the bigger ones, fraud is baked in to the income statement. How many investment banks have had to pay fines this year for fraud? Wells Fargo? Check. Bank of America has in the past? Check. Morgan Stanley has in the past, check. Nobody's gone to jail, it's a fine. So it becomes part, it becomes part of what you budget. You budget for fraud. So Dorota, what do you think of this film? <laughs> well, uh, the executive producer, Frank Marshall, was the source of many of my childhood nightmares after his film, Arachnophobia destroyed my life, essentially. Um, and now he's given me a whole new set of nightmares to freak out over, but modern ones this time. Uh, there is a lot to worry about uh, in this film, particularly if you watch the news and see the U.S. government's you know, continual push to deregulate banks from the evidence in this film that does not seem like a good idea. Okay, next is the director, Jason Cohn, who won the 2007 Sundance Grand Prize for his first film, Mandabala, Send a Bullet. Ten years later, he brings us his second film, and it's very much worth the wait. Cohn got his start working with Errol Morris, and that really comes through with the high production value he brings to his interviews. This new film is about the controversial tennis coach Nick Boletari, and the title is Love Means Zero. Boletari is now in his 80s, and he's looking back on his complex, often rocky relationships with famous clients like Andre Agassi and Boris Becker. The interview banter between Cohn and Boletari is like a tennis match itself. You see, everybody watching this, Jason, they got to understand Nick, baby. They got to understand me, okay? I'm not jiving you by saying I don't remember. I've just moved on. But what happens when, in your relentless desire to win, you end up hurting people? I have no comment. I just do it. If I hurt you, maybe I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't dwell into these things. I really don't. If you look at Nick's history, Nick does not look back. I just go forward. If you ask me right now to give you the names of my eight wives, I couldn't do it. You think I'm kidding? I wanted to come across loud and clear. I did not think about things. I did not think of the ramifications, whether negative or positive or whatever, or neutral. That's me. Can I explain that? No, I can't explain that. But my job is to make meaning. I got to make meaning out of this. Maybe for the first time in your career, you're up against somebody that is tough to make meaning out of, OK? That happens. Now, if you're good, you find a way to make this successful. Now, it's up to you how you take a character like me, do it a little different, 
and make it a success, which I'm sure you will. Because if I didn't have confidence in you, baby, I wouldn't be doing it. My parents are avid tennis watchers, and I grew up um, watching some of these matches referenced in the film. So I really enjoyed this documentary on many levels. Uh, also, anything with even a slight reference to Brooke Shields, and I'm completely in. Brooke Shields does have a, a prominent moment in this film. Yeah, there's also, uh, you know, another thing that really stood out to me is that is is watching a man in his, you know, late years of his life deal with his toxic masculinity. I found it really, really fascinating. There is a lot of toxicness uh, going on. Uh, and he's going to be here, uh, I'm told. Can't wait. We should get matching tennis outfits. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Tom winked at me. He's in. <laughs> Uh, so Love Means Zero is produced by Showtime Documentary Films, led by Vinnie Malhotra. And that division has another film that came as a surprise to me. Uh, it's Eric Clapton, Life in 12 Bars. Bell bottom rouge, you made me cry. I don't meaning. The director is Lily Finney Zanuck. She has a long career as a Hollywood producer of films like Driving Miss Daisy and Mulholland Drive. She gets Clapton to be very forthcoming about his life, going all the way back to his childhood. I knew that I was different. I knew that other kids at school regarded me as different or maybe inferior. And I did have a massive inferiority complex. And I didn't know why. Then I found out that my sister was really my mother. She left when I was very, very young, and I was raised by my grandparents. I wanted to know the most important thing. You're my mum. Are you going to be my mum? And she said, no. I think it's best that we leave it the way it is. Patty Boyd's autobiography, Wonderful Tonight, George Harrison, Eric Clapton, and Me is one of my favorites, and I've been craving just to know any more information ever since, so this film came at a great time. You know, in addition to Clapton, she's uh, pulled out interviews, older interviews with George Harrison and uh, people who are deceased, and she's got new interviews with Patty Boyd uh, and others, uh, and it really put them together seamlessly. The last cluster of films we're going to discuss on this episode are four biographies of black cultural figures. We already talked about Grace Jones. We have another icon from the fashion world in Vogue writer Andre Leon Talley. If you also obsessively watched fashion television in the 90s, you'll know Mr. Leon Talley. But this film goes much deeper than fashion, and we learn about many of the hidden struggles he endured as a black man in the fashion world. Talley talks movingly about two key women in his life— his grandmother, who raised him in North Carolina, and Diana Vreeland, who became his mentor when he was a young man in New York City. The only Christmas I was ever away, first Christmas, was December 1974, when I had gone to the Met Ball. And um, Mrs. Vreeland said to me, you must stay. It'll happen for you in the new year. And I called my grandmother on Christmas Eve. She said, you have to come home. It's Christmas. You have to come home. I said, no, because Mrs. Vreeland told me that she, it will happen. I will get a job in the new year. And I have to stay in New York. She says, you have to come home. You just have to. I says, why do you want me at home? I kept coaxing her to tell me why. And she said, because I know you're sleeping with a white woman. And I, I just said, I laughed. I started laughing. And I thought, if she only knew. The title of this film is The Gospel According to Andre. Its director, Kate Novak, has produced several documentaries, including Ivory Tower and Page One Inside the New York Times. This is her first film as a solo director. So have you thought about what you're going to wear to the screening? <laughs> I've thought a lot about what I'm going to wear to the screening, and I'm going to keep on thinking about it until that day. Me too. I am freaking out, and I have to buy backups. <laughs> So our next film takes us back to New York City in the late 70s, early 80s, when artists were out to change the beat, like in the Fab Five Freddy song. The film is called Boom for Real, the late teenage years of Jean-Michel Basquiat, the filmmaker is Sarah Driver, who is a contemporary of Basquiat's in the downtown scene 
where artists, filmmakers, and musicians all overlapped. Today, we know Basquiat as an artist whose work recently set an auction record for an American painting. Driver goes back to a time when he was essentially homeless, looking for any place to make his art. Here's a sequence interviewing several prominent graffiti artists from that era. But I knew that Jean was not one of the writers. He was never really a graffiti artist, you know? I mean, he was not part of the culture, you know? I mean, there was a, we, a way we dressed, how we spoke. He wasn't part of that. Well, graffiti, I mean, anyone that's scribbling something on the wall becomes graffiti, you know, being black and writing words. He's tagged as a graffiti artist. But that was his canvas, you know? He didn't really have a place to live, so if he wanted to create something, he put it outside on the wall. Something that really made an impression on me in this film is how many testimonies there are of people who attest to the confidence uh, Basquiat had in the fact that he would be a world-famous artist. It was really amazing to see that he was so self-assured and self-aware. What I really liked about this film is that the choice of interview subjects are really the people who knew Basquiat. It's not like they're bringing in uh, you know, art critics uh, who uh, only know his work and didn't know the person. You're really hearing from the people who knew him as a person, and he comes across more human for that. Okay, two more films to talk about. The first is Sammy Davis Jr., I Gotta Be Me. I gotta be me. I gotta be me. What else can I be but what I am? The director is Sam Pollard, who has a long film career. He was one of the directors on the landmark civil rights series Eyes on the Prize 2. And he's been an editor on several of Spike Lee's films, including the two documentaries about New Orleans. For Sammy Davis Jr., he's tracking a life that crosses through several different epochs of American entertainment. And we see the rapidly changing perception of black performers from the early days of race films into the 50s with Sinatra and the Rat Pack, and into the 70s when Sammy Davis Jr. was seen by many as a kind of square figure. In the early 70s, he was famously photographed hugging Richard Nixon, and soon after that, he went to a big rally of Jesse Jackson's push campaign for minority businesses. Early in the film, we see a scene of him confronting the crowd at that rally. It's incredibly striking. Sammy Davis Jr. is alone on stage. There's a big audience of very emotional people who are giving him a hard time uh, about this Nixon photograph. And this is what he says. Disagree, if you will, with my politics. Good, 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 but don't, I will not allow anyone to take away the fact that I am black. And I can only add that it wasn't easy to come here, but being, (laughs) trying to be a brother, it would have been very easy to avoid it, but I had to face this. So what's incredible about this moment is that you can see Davis turning the crowd. I have gone through some changes and that's it. Now that's all I can say except that I would like to sing if you would like for me to sing. If you don't want me to sing, then I won't. That clip shows some of Davis's political life, but a lot of the film also focuses on him as a performer, which I think are some of the most extraordinary parts of the film. I could watch him dance all day. Actually, we should sign up for dance classes. (laughs) In our tennis outfits or not? Tennis outfits, dance classes. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So the Sammy Davis Jr. film comes from the American Masters series out of New York's public TV station WNET. That series was founded by Susan Lacey, who ran it for many years and then left three years ago. And it was really in question what was going to become of this series. It got taken over by Michael Cantor, who's done a tremendous job with it. Uh, They've started an American Masters podcast and a theatrical imprint. They've gotten behind films such as Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You, and Janice, Little Girl Blue, about Janice Joplin that had a TIFF premiere in 2015. They also funded the final film we're going to talk about, a biography of the playwright Lorraine Hansberry. The title of the film is Sighted Eyes, Feeling Heart. That comes from a line of Hansberry's, One cannot live with sighted eyes and feeling heart and not know or react to the miseries which afflict this world. 
Hansberry was also an activist, a friend of James Baldwin, and inspired this song by Nina Simone. Lorraine Hansberry's short life ended at 34, and we can only speculate at how massive a cultural figure she could have been. Of course, though very short, her life and work are extremely significant. She was the first black woman to write a play performed on Broadway, A Raisin in the Sun, looking at black Americans living under racial segregation in Chicago. She was a lesbian, an activist, an artist. And whether you know of her or not already, you should definitely seek out this film. This is a clip of her in 1964 at New York's Town Hall. It isn't as if we got up today and said, you know, what can we do to irritate America? You know, it's because that since 1619, Negroes have tried every method of communication, of transformation of their situation, from petition to the vote, everything. We've tried it all. There isn't anything that hasn't been exhausted. And now the charge of impatience is simply unbearable. I think Hansberry's career is ripe for rediscovery, and director Tracy Heather Strain has done a great job with it. So we've got a lot more to talk about, including films on political resistance, viewpoints from around the world, the crop of Canadian documentaries, and what to expect from TIFF Doc Conference. That's all coming up on our next episode 54, when I'll be back with... Me, Dorota Lech.